The time is coming when the need for impenetrable walls and incorruptible guards fades away as AI takes over the task of guarding criminals. The only way to escape justice now is to deceive the electronic mind. Can you see? The memory stays the same. I didn't know what was real anymore. A young man wakes up in a sterile, futuristic-looking prison cell. Overcoming his confusion, Frank begins to converse with a human voice coming from the observation camera on the ceiling. The last thing he remembers is a blow to his head, after which everything went dark. Straining his memory, he recalls his name, Frank, and he communicates with a life support operator named Howard. Frank tries to figure out what he's doing here and how he ended up here. What is this place, anyway? Frank mentions that the room is located on an underground level. He must acclimate a person to the conditions of the containment. A realization dawns on Frank. Was he arrested? But he has not done anything wrong. He has no criminal record. He is a civilian. Howard only knows that Frank's intake data is currently being processed. The man tries to convince Howard of his innocence. He repeats that he has no report, no arrest record, and no connection to the protests against the dominance of machines. He is a civilian and he demands a lawyer. But once again, he receives a negative response, which leaves Frank utterly perplexed. Howard insists that his main task is to sustain human life. Frank remembers his morning at home when Howard's voice offered him water with four different flavors, food and music. However, the man is subdued and uninterested in all the offerings, although the music suggestion initially surprises him. Then Howard suggests taking a walk and stretching the legs, and in front of the man appears a treadmill. Disappointed, Frank wants to know the length of his detention, but the voice indifferently states that it will depend on the speed of processing his data. This infuriates the man, and he demands a chance to speak to the operator. But Howard is not capable of that. He is just a steward following a protocol. Frank is frustrated, and it makes him angry. After all, there is always someone responsible for people's detention. His last name is Lerner, and perhaps by knowing it, one can check the reason for the man's confinement. He cannot be held like this without a cause. He has rights. And once again, he receives the standard response, no access. Frank grows increasingly irritated. After all, he has rights. But Howard refers to some video that Frank simply couldn't see as he was injected, fell asleep and woke up here. It could be a simple mistake. The action rolls back to the moment when Frank is at home, taking a shower, feeding his dog, and listening to the TV news about a missing civil rights activist, Fletcher May, and clashes between militants and the police. Back in his cell, Frank paces from corner to corner, distressed that no one even knows what happened to him or where he disappeared to. After all, he should have friends and family. A conversation between Howard and Frank ensues about their places of birth. The man grew up in the South, while Howard hails from a small town called Austin, not far from Seattle. But as to why he has such a job looking after an innocent person, Howard cannot provide an answer. Frank reminds Howard of his civil rights. After all, Howard could bypass his protocol. Without receiving a coherent response, he asks for something to eat. Howard suggests chicken, beef, or vegetables, but Frank himself does not know what he wants. Moreover, he is worried about his dog, left behind in the apartment. The dog will die if no one comes. So he asks Howard to contact someone who can take care of the pet. And again, he gets the standard response. When Frank raises his voice, Howard simply turns off the lights and removes the camera. Frank is infuriated. At night, half dreaming, he remembers the nighttime streets and car lights. Morning comes, and the camera returns. Frank asks for water when Howard notices a puddle on the floor. But the man reminds him that they didn't even provide him with a bucket. Howard immediately opens the bathroom door, and while Frank is inside, the cell undergoes cleaning. But who did it? Later, Frank sees himself again in an evening cafe, ordering a regular coffee from a friendly bartender. Back in the cell, he receives food that tastes revolting, but Howard assures him that it contains everything necessary for survival. When Frank asks if Howard himself has tasted this concoction, the standard response states that such information is not available. Frank is puzzled, what does this even mean? And he starts repeating Howard's name, to which he receives an unchanging response. Only then does the man realize that he is communicating with a computer. This upsets him, and he is not willing to talk to a machine anymore. He needs a human. 
The man raises his voice, demanding to be let out. After thinking about it, Frank is even more astonished because Howard mentioned his birthplace. But this is no problem for the AI. It was assembled in Austin, but programmed in Seattle. He mentions his brand, and Frank is impressed. Very expensive equipment delivers his food and removes waste. In general, he despises computers. Some things just can't be computerized. Frank mentally transports himself to the bar. The barista girl tries to guess his name, and he notices the scanning device and examines the photos on the wall. The girl admits that these are her work and correctly guesses his real name. At that moment, armed men appear behind him. Then there is a flash, and he is back in his cell. Memories flash by, after which Frank seems to recall more details. But the conclusion is the same, a blow to the back. And the cell, where the artificial intelligence reminds him that its task is to sustain human life and keep him within this space. While discussing sarcasm with Howard, Frank notices that he's talking to the computer as if it were a living person. He wonders if there were others here before him and how often the AI's memory is wiped. He shares with the computer that when his father got sick, he was hooked up to a machine that kept him alive for four years. The machine gave him a life he didn't ask for, so life should be as it is. After this, Howard informs him of an error. He came from the same place they sent him to. But the administrator will only come if Howard is broken. The program knows Frank will do that, so it will defend itself. Frank turns away. He'll come up with another way. And he asks for coffee. While Howard is distracted, Frank hits him. Immediately, gas starts entering the cell. The visions of the cafe, the photo landscape, and the girl return. But for some reason, the attackers did not come. Frank tries to find inconsistencies, and he realizes the girl didn't take his money for the coffee, and the scanner didn't activate. She asks for his help to close up, like lifting the chairs for example. The scanner continues to bother Frank, he asks for coffee again, and he realizes the scanner is giving him the identification number of a different person. He regains consciousness in his cell. It all becomes clear. He has been mistaken for somebody else. Howard objects because the bioscan doesn't make mistakes. But Frank insists he entered the system under someone else's ID. However, Howard reminds him he took that ID from his memory. Perhaps that's what he wants to see. But Frank cannot control his subconscious. The main thing now is to understand whose ID it is. He looks at the fan and finds himself back in his bed. The day repeats, but this time he sees his father hooked up to machines. Then an explosion and Frank is back in the cell. But this time it's dark and Howard does not respond to his queries. Frank starts shouting and asking for help, but he gets no response. Suddenly, he hears a sound from the ventilation grate. Frank looks into it and sees a man who explains that his allies managed to break the alliance and destroy the entire network. He always advocated for breaking the power source and would give anything to see those damn machines break down. Then he reveals his name, Fletcher May. Frank notices that Fletcher is armed with an iron pipe. Fletcher explains that he took the pipe from the shower, whose door opened by itself when the power went out. Frank does not believe it was just a power outage, as there were explosions. Could the transformer have exploded? The system might have struck itself. What if there is nobody left? Meanwhile, Fletcher ecstatically shouts that he broke through the wall. But, it's the same damn concrete. The man cries in disappointment. Then he confesses that he was experimented on with a substance that makes secrets be revealed. But even he can be deceived. Secrets shouldn't be concealed. One just needs to think in detail about something else. Memory is unchangeable, but the entry point has changed. May is sure that he won't survive the night because he no longer knows what's real and what's not. He bids farewell as gas fills his cell. Frank wakes up in his cell. He remembers Fletcher, but the grate is in place. Howard comes back to life, and with eerie accuracy, the first day repeats. The visions of the cafe and the girl return. He is surprised that she knows his name, and then the scanner activates. Frank hides because he does not want to get shot. He confesses he is being held in a government facility and they are using a neural scanner to find evidence of a crime he didn't commit. She is in his memory and this day keeps repeating again and again. And he can't control the return to the bunker. It all repeats again and again. The morning, the cafe, Gabby, Howard, the cell, shots to the back. One day, Frank recalls May's words about a way to preserve the secret. He and Gabby capture his pursuers who try to extract answers from them. But Frank quickly realizes that it's all in his imagination. He tries to convey this to Gabby. She consoles him. Someday they will understand everything. 
Throughout all this time, Frank talks to Howard and notices that at a certain time, the AI shuts down for a few seconds. Frank tells Gabby about his discovery. He will have 12 seconds, which means he's approaching a reboot. The next cycle will only be in three months, so the attempt to break out can be made today, although if he could stay with her forever, he would. And the woman asks him to find her true self. She takes the money, the scanner activates, armed men, a gunshot, and Frank finds himself back in the cell. Howard starts the usual conversation. Frank asks for coffee and begins to repeat the same phrase, which confuses Howard. He asks Howard to open the toilet and positions himself at the doorway. And then Howard freezes. Frank covers the camera with a bag and retrieves the pipe from the bathroom. He covers his face protecting himself from the gas as Howard comes back online and the cleaner enters the cell. But Frank manages to block him with the pipe and jumps into the corridor. He escapes outside, finds himself in the desert and heads towards distant mountains. Throw wind turbines ahead, but no people. Having rested in the shade, he continues forward until he notices a gas station. Frank enters the deserted store, takes out a bottle of water and starts drinking. Suddenly, he sees a photo from Gabby's cafe. The bottle slips from his hand and he finds himself back in his cell. In despair, Frank declares that he will no longer eat or drink. If he dies, Howard won't be able to do his job. So it's better to let him go. And by the way, he knows why he's being held here. He was part of the Alliance and created a virus to disrupt the system. Frank managed to lock away the memories in his brain and the authorities didn't find the flash drive with the virus. Now Howard is broken and nobody's coming to fix him because there's no one left here. To save his life, Frank must bypass the protocol and open the door. But Howard refuses as he can only do what he's programmed for. Then Frank puts a noose around his neck and stands on a chair. Howard anxiously asks him to stop these actions. In another reality, he enters the cafe and sits in front of Gabby. Frank hangs himself right on Howard's stand, even though the AI almost hysterically repeats his pleas. Gabby asks him to wake up. The noose breaks, but the door is already open. Howard still helped Frank. He finds the room with the control panel, but there is no one there, and everything is in ruins. He speaks to Howard one last time, bids him farewell, and emerges onto the snow-covered surface and heads towards distant mountains. And when he descends into the valley, he freezes in astonishment. It's Gabby's landscape. And as he feels he's about to freeze, tourists find him. The news on television states that he is the sole survivor of a sinner abandoned by the military about two years ago. His life was sustained by a special system and energy came from wind power stations until the supplies ran out. Over 300 prisoners were found dead. This is a crime of the regime that trampled on all human rights and was swept away by an uprising led by the Alliance. Frank is welcome to the new world. He enters the cafe and sees the photo. And the girl. He orders coffee and thanks Gabby. But she's surprised. Why did he call her that? She's Madeline. And she starts guessing his name. The movie is definitely not for everybody where everyone will see and understand something of their own. But the main question remains unanswered. Why do people strive to computerize everything around them? After all, even the most sophisticated computer falls short of a human because the soul cannot be digitized.